Anesthesia is the most mysterious branch of medicine because we are directly manipulating your consciousness. And in modern medicine, we don't understand consciousness. So it's a bit like probing the unknown. But it's a highly secretive and private unknown that we're directly dealing with in the most vulnerable moments of your life when you're having surgery. And we rarely tell patients the details of what happens. I'm Dr. Anthony Kabe, a Stanford and Harvard trained anesthesiologist and integrative medicine specialist. And I find it baffling that in movies, they treat general surgery and anesthesia as like taking a nap while your body is cut open. That cannot be farther from the truth. That's because anesthesia, whether the liquid like the propofol I'm holding here, or the gas that comes out of the ventilator here, deactivates the nerves in your brain, but also the rest of your body so that your body can safely tolerate the surgery and being cut open. And this is where the chaos ensues because as we deactivate those nerves, it causes chaos throughout all of those organs in your body that are being shut down slowly, like your heart, your kidneys, and your muscles. And if the dose of the anesthesia is too high, it can take that comatose state that we want your body to be in safely for surgery right up until the doorsteps of death, which is why you should be careful the next time you're asking your anesthesiologist for more anesthesia before surgery. And it's also why you should know what happens to your body in surgery so that you can speak up for yourself to get the best possible surgery care that you deserve. This all starts with the fact that anesthesia disables your nervous system, which is responsible for nearly all of your body's normal functioning. Nerve signals keep your heart pumping, your stomach churning, and even your bladder peeing. Anesthesia, especially general anesthesia, will deactivate these organ systems in a dose-dependent fashion, meaning the higher the dose, the more organs get affected. And if not done under doctor's supervision, it can be life-threatening. At the lowest doses, anesthetics will deactivate our inhibitions, like with benzodiazepines like Versed here. It's similar to being intoxicated with alcohol or cannabis. This holds for gas anesthetics like laughing gas here in the ventilator, or with liquid anesthetics like that Versed or propofol. It's very interesting that deactivating inhibitions can decrease anxiety, which very tangibly shows up on our operating room monitors as reduced heart rate and blood pressure. This is because anxiety can have very real effects on your cardiovascular system, increasing your heart rate and blood pressure, like some patients who have white coat hypertension whose blood pressure shoots through the roof when they walk into their doctor's office. And yes, as patients begin to feel more relaxed, they'll begin to say silly things. I could write a whole book on the silly things that the last 10,000 patients I've cared for have blurted out when they had that de-inhibition from anesthesia, but I'll save that for a different video. As the dose of anesthesia increases, more systems begin to go offline. After deactivating your inhibitions, anesthesia will then reduce your memory forming capacity, rendering amnesia, leading patients to not remember what happens around them. At these doses of amnesia, the heart and lungs and other organs are largely unaffected. As the dose of anesthesia rises even higher, the cortex of the brain begins to go offline as well. And that's where we believe a lot of our consciousness resides. Turning the cortex off can thereby lead to loss of consciousness. And this is when the body begins to be prepared for having surgery here on the table. Unfortunately, at those doses, the rest of the organs begin to go out of whack as well. Just a reminder that if you're learning something new about your body, please hit that like button and share what you've learned with your loved ones, especially if they're having surgery. Learning what happens to your body is so important so that you can feel more empowered to speak up for yourself and advocate for yourself in these scary situations. If you don't know what's happening to your body, how can you know what questions to ask to get the best possible care that you deserve? Now, as the dose of anesthesia goes even higher and those organs go offline, your anesthesiologist needs to have a whole host of life support tools here to help keep you safe and alive during your surgery. As those organs go offline, so do your brain and spinal cords reflexes, which will help your body tolerate the surgery by not reflexively kicking the surgeon, but will also turn off your brainstem's reflexes to breathe. 
And this is why we need to place breathing tubes like what you see here to keep your body breathing while you're unconscious and your brainstem is deactivated during surgery. And this is one of the scariest parts for all anesthesiologists because if we cannot get this breathing tube in place quickly and we can't get oxygen to your brain, your brain could suffer a stroke or your heart could have a heart attack. Remember that your brain can only go a few minutes without oxygen before the tissue begins to die and a little bit longer for your heart, but not that much longer. Unfortunately, the duration of action of medications like propofol that put you to sleep and paralyzing medications like succinylcholine here to help us place that breathing tube for you can be minutes which can be longer than the time that it takes for your brain to suffer a stroke, meaning that we need to very quickly get that breathing tube placed because if we can't get it there in time, your body will still be asleep as your brain begins to lose its tissue. Fortunately, in the 21st century, we have so many fancy tools like literal cameras that we place into your throat to place the breathing tube so that we minimize those risks to very, very low levels. Literally, seconds matter here. Next, after we deactivate your brainstem's breathing reflexes, anesthesia doses can go higher and turn off your heart's reflexive beating. And we need to have a whole bunch of medications available to raise your heart rate and blood pressure so that we make sure that blood and nutrients are reaching your vital organs. If dealing with low heart rate and blood pressure wasn't challenging enough, the opposite can also happen when you're having surgery back here because surgical stimuli, like being cut open, can also raise your heart rate and blood pressure if your body's reflexes are not completely abolished. And that's why we need to use medications like medication grade opioids like fentanyl to keep your body relaxed and calm. The same thing can be accomplished with medications coming out of the ventilator here like the anesthesia gas or with medications like ketamine or beta blockers like labetalol and metoprolol that we have in all of our anesthesia carts. Now the important point here is not to artificially lower heart rate and blood pressure with beta blockers if the patient might be a little bit awake and actually feeling the pain. That means you need to give more anesthesia to lower the heart rate and blood pressure, not just artificially sledgehammer it down with those medications. In addition to the ventilator here and the breathing tubes and all the medications that we have in our carts, we also need to have electricity available because sometimes the heart might just stop beating altogether if the dose of anesthesia is too high or if the patient has pre-existing heart disease. The rule in emergencies in medicine is Edison before medicine, meaning that we need to shock the heart before scrambling to find medications to give in the IV if a real emergency is happening, especially here in the operating room. Fortunately, emergencies like this are very rare in healthy patients having routine elective surgeries, but your anesthesiologist needs to be prepared 24 seven to manage a crisis if it happens. It's very similar to piloting an airplane where the majority of the flight goes just fine, but the pilot has to be on edge and ready to go the second crisis hits. If this all sounds scary to you, it's because it can be. It's why we go to school for over 10 years to master the workings of the human body, the interactions with surgery, and all these different medications and breathing tube techniques here so that we can keep you safe and comfortable during the surgery. And there's a lot that you can do to also increase the safety of surgery. Things like telling your doctor about any recreational drugs you use, especially stimulants like cocaine or methamphetamines, or cannabis, which can completely change your body's response to certain anesthetic medications. Your heart health, your lung health are all very important to tell your anesthesiologist because that also impacts the medications that we give you, as you can see. And never underplay the importance of your mental health. Patients with medical PTSD in particular are more prone to having complications under anesthesia or after the anesthesia wears off, such as emergence delirium, maybe worsening of depression or anxiety after surgery is over, maybe even cognitive impairment. There's still a lot to the human body and brain that we're learning about. But if there's anything that patients can do to help protect themselves, I want them to feel comfortable advocating and asking the right questions so they can be empowered in an otherwise very unempowering environment where we're literally wiping your memories and turning your body off. And that's not where it ends. 
because your mindset before surgery can even reduce the risk of things like blood clots and infections after surgery. So don't be afraid or ashamed to ask questions of your anesthesiologist or your surgeon or their nurses or anyone else in the operating room before you go to sleep. The better prepared you are, the better you can advocate for yourself to get that care that you deserve. If you learned something new, please hit that like button and share what you've learned with others. Let me know in the comments below what else you want to learn about in the mysterious medical field. And remember to think twice before willy-nilly asking your anesthesiologist for more anesthesia next time.